I V M. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Uncle Please Set. I'm Joel Pereira, and with me is my co-host and buddy Tushar Abhichandani. Tushar, how's it going? It uh, is going exactly the same as it has been going for the last six months. <laughs> Have you watched this movie Groundhog Day? Yeah, this is this is our Groundhog Day. This is our Groundhog Day, basically, where every morning yeah. and every day seems exactly the same as the last day. The only difference is that I think that maybe uh, you know what I, I was talking about this to someone where I haven't met. I've met a few people, like maybe like friends and stuff, but I haven't met anyone new yeah. in. the last 6 months okay i've Definitely. met only like my closest friends who i can be absolute when they tell me look man i haven't met anyone in the past 2 weeks i'm like okay i trust you but i haven't <laughs> met anyone new since like june at least which is unbelievable man yeah man it's it's, it's kind of insane no when you think about it how is the our social lives are dead completely now at this point of time what like social life you know and and the best part is that i live um i live in bombay and bars and restaurants have begun to open and there are three near like within 50 meters of my house and sometimes i walk past them in the evenings and i see people hanging around outside and i have this weird feeling of derision for them ki like they are what are you doing and at the same time it's like <laughs> Am I the chutia bird? Because yeah, I know. am I am I the chump for being all like terrified of going out no, and meeting people? You know, or going and, and the number of people I know who've gone out uh, and had no problems, and then other people who've taken every precaution in the book and still gotten it. It's exactly. Absurd. It's absurd. It, but uh, I think uh, we're going too off track now. <laughs> Yeah, but I was just going to say. Now I was just going to say that at least we do this podcast once a week, and we get to meet new people virtually. Yeah. And uh, today on our show we have someone who's actually been on our show before a while ago. Uh, his name is Siddharth Singh. He's an energy and climate policy analyst and the author of the Great Smog of India. Siddharth Singh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here, man. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Sushar. This is the this is the first time that someone's uh, re-invited me to their podcast. So I think uh, I was the vote of confidence boring you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no vote of confidence. All Board the reactions from the audience, <laughs> and as if, as I just said, uh, Siddharth is a climate policy analyst, energy and climate policy analyst, and of course the author of the Great Smog of India. So we all know what today's uh, topic is going to be. Uh, I wonder what like, it is. <laughs> winter is here, yeah. and if you are in North India right now, your eyes are probably blurry and your nose is running. As Siddharth is said, will tell us because he lives there. he lives there and of course and uh, you know before we uh, siddharth you were talking about the pollution in delhi right now yeah i mean uh, so it's just the like last week has been terrible uh, more mm. terrible than it usually is but mm. i personally have been uh, having a good time because uh, firstly we have been you know asked because of the lockdown and and pandemic in general we are supposed to be home and i've been home <laughs> and yeah. i have air purifiers running all the time so the air quality inside my house is probably as good as i don't know switzerland or manipur but uh, <laughs> yeah but outside is terrible like sometimes we open the door you know to to accept like groceries or something like that and yeah. the air purifiers quickly turn red and they just go like berserk for a few minutes wow. and then they takes time for them to kind of get the air quality back on track you know we've been we've kept I like I live in I live in Bombay and our air quality is not great but it's not necessarily killing us all the time and I remember this one time I was in Delhi I was in uh, Greater Noida okay and I was doing uh, I was at the Buddh circuit the uh, the race track right and there's this JP hotel over there and I was staying there and I would go out in the morning come back in the evening and one day I happened to get back to the hotel room a little early I think by around 5:36 I got back to the hotel room and um, there was an air purifier in the corner and it was running and i for for a bit i thought okay air purifier it's happening i had never seen one like i'd never actually like been in a room with one or maybe hadn't paid attention to it or whatever and at around 637 this uh, hotel staff comes to the room and he comes and he like you know whatever changes the towel and does my bed and whatever and he has these filters with him okay and he goes to the air purifier and he removes one filter and it's covered with like half an inch of crud okay like some black gunk which i've 
Like in Bombay, you know how our ACs, when you clean the filter, the kind you'd see after two months of use. Okay, so I'm like, oh wow, that's the kind of pollution this thing is cleaning out. And I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, how how often do you change them? I was expecting him to say once a week or once a month, and he's like, sir, every day. <laughs> I'm wow. like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, sir, every day, every day we have to change them because in another day it will get clogged. So I was like, I'm like, damn. You know, and when you can see evidence yeah. of the stuff that would actually go into your body, thanks to the air you breathe, it's I. I I don't know. Like that was a turning point for me, man. As far as air pollution was concerned. No, that that uh, seriously is. I think visually when you see it, sometimes so some of these uh, you know filters are washable. Most of them are not. So when okay. you take the washable component of it out and just kind of you know spray water on it, the mm. kind of black liquid that falls below it it almost seems like you're in a workshop where you know cars are being fixed and that's like oil leaking. It's just yeah. terrible. It's mucky. It's thick. especially because these particles are too too tiny so it's not like you know sand mixed with water yeah. it's more like mm. it's so properly mixed it's almost like you know coca cola is flowing out yeah. yeah it looks terrible no man you're right because by the way hmm. what is it's also very purifiers. expensive like uh, these uh, these so these purifiers <laughs> like the filters will cost about 2 and a half to 3000 rupees and oh, wow. they barely last for like 1 and a half two months So if you really like, uh, you know, uh, care to to have clean air, then you're spending literally mm. thousands of rupees every year. That's oh damn! Yeah. No, but you know, I've also seen like forget what your what your breathing is one thing, but I used to ride. Um, I remember once I was riding back into Delhi, and it was I think December or something like that. I got back to the hotel and I showered, and the kind of stuff that and and this is. i'm wearing a helmet i'm wearing pants i'm like you know riding pants the thick ones and boots and gloves and a riding jacket and everything and yet the kind of stuff that came off me i was fascinated man i'm standing in the bathroom and i'm like what the <laughs> f- is happening guys so yeah i, I don't mean, know where any of it came from also this reminds me of uh, you know back in the day my parents used to tell me this that in the 1990s Hmm. the air and quality uh, the 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 uh, air quality in delhi was so bad that when people used to spit their spit used to contain like uh, you know brownish yeah. or blackish uh, you know yeah. uh, material so, so it was vehicles, was yeah and uh, cuz back then we didn't have cng, CNG yeah. so i think it was more visible in that sense even though perhaps air quality is worse today but hmm. it was uh, like today's air quality is worse because of the nature of the particles hmm. but is back then it was more visible because it was black carbon from diesel exhaust hmm. Hmm. so all right so before we sort of jump into more detail uh, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and sort of just dive into the topic Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I want to let you all know about two new shows that we've launched this week. The first one is Millennial Athlete, hosted by Tanvi and Shlok. Both of them are, you know, they spent their life playing badminton, and they know a lot of athletes, and they want to talk about the particular challenges that athletes face. Really, really great conversations. Do definitely check that out. The other show that I wanted to mention to you that we launched this week is Non Curry. Non Curry is a show about the, it's about food and the history of food and the economics around food and consumption and all that kind of stuff. It's a really, really interesting conversation. It's hosted by Sadaf, the author chef and former Master Chef India finalist, and Archit, who is a researcher who writes on behavioral science and economics. Definitely, definitely worth checking out. Besides that, we had a great week as always, right? You know, great stuff on all the normal shows. Do check those out. But with that, let me get you back to your show. And we are back. With us is uh, Tushar Abhi Chandani and also Siddharth Singh, who is a climate policy analyst and the author of the Great Smog of India. Siddharth, welcome back to the show. Uh, before we left, we were talking just general, making general conversation about how Delhi is Delhi air pollution is sucky. But is it? There's also a lot of the national media is in Delhi, right? So it gets a lot of coverage. and it's a relatively recent phenomenon people talking about yeah. the 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 quality of delhi's air and before we took a break you were talking about your folks um in the 90s talking about uh, how bad it was is is De- is bad air in delhi just a historic problem um yes and no so it's historic okay. enough that uh, it goes back a few decades but not okay. historic enough that it goes back to say independence you know okay. so so 
the nature of the air pollution problem has changed even though air pollution itself has has stayed in in mm. it, it has it peaked somewhere around in the 1990s due to a, a basic boom in uh, diesel and kerosene using vehicles so back in the day if you remember people also also used to mix kerosene in their uh, vehicles because kerosene mm, yeah. is way cheaper and and it's yeah. a far dirtier fuel basically you're not supposed to use it in transport mm. uh, so due to a combination of those reasons air pollution peaked in the 1990s then in, uh, around 2000 that's when we moved to cng through a, a, a act not an act a judgment of the supreme court and since uh, the, after that air quality improved significantly in the following mm. years but mm. of course the nature of the economy is such that it keeps moving and you know eventually there were even more cars on the road even more construction activity even more industries and all along the, along the way the stubble burning problem also continued to grow so mm. so the nature of the problem has changed but yes air pollution as such has uh, has remained so but what's uh, what's happened like post the cng transition uh, around 2002 2003 i think uh, what's uh, given rise to this new sort of increase in pollution that's happened post around i think 2009 10 where uh, the volume has greatly increased not just delhi primarily through north india yeah so See, first, what is the reason for that firstly i think uh, you know car and vehicle ownership in general has boomed so okay. you have uh, you know uh, i don't i mean i could have done a back of the envelope call calculation but cars since the 1990s or since 2000 have you know uh, uh, increased by a significant number we add almost uh, several hundred cars every day in in a city like delhi it's already mm. kind of you know filled to the brim so even though the fuel itself is cleaner mm. even mm. though the exhausts are not kind of you know re- releasing the same amount or the same kind of exhaust we there are just so many more cars that yeah. on the sum it is still very it is way higher than uh, say it was back then from the mm. transport sector alone but it's not mm. just a transport sector problem because mm. in this mm. time there's also been a construction boom in delhi delhi did mm. not have the kind of high rises and so on that that uh, you know uh, that we do now in the sense that maybe not the city itself but around, along the city you have uh, you know gurgaon faridabad noida so there are high rises there's new construction activity which is le- which is fueled the need for bricks so mm. now suddenly around delhi you have thousands of brick kilns so if you ever drive from say delhi to uh, agra you will mm. along the way find hundreds if if not thousands of of chimneys just mm. uh, letting out like black soot all of this stays in this area it's not that there are winds that are carrying it away so mm. that has also co- contributed to the problem then in addition to that of course we use more electricity now which now back in the day there were also power cuts and in general there were lower energy demands so now electricity demand is increased so there's more coal that is being used to you know generate electricity again uh, you know some of the coal fired power plants in in the city of delhi have been shut down but there are still mm. others that are around mm. and of course uh, you know area under agri- under uh, irrigation and agriculture in punjab and haryana have also grown which means that there is more land and more stubble and mm. therefore there is more stubble burning and mm. uh, so this is what has changed in the last 20 30 years back in the day it was a transport sector problem so th- mm. it was easy to solve mm. through one you know court uh, judgment because it was a one sector problem now it mm. is a five sector problem with uh, with each of them having a 20% share i mean 20% is just a broad generalization it, it fluctuates you know depending on the day and time and Year mm. time of the year, but it's a five sector problem now. Mm. Mm. So, uh, how much does it have to do with sort of the geographical location and the the climate conditions of the region? So that's an actually excellent question because if you think about it, uh, you know, transport uh, has generally mushroomed or grown not just in Delhi, right? It's a mm. pan India issue. Mm. Similarly, industries have come out everywhere. In fact. Uh, probably no city has industries around it the way say chennai does you know chennai is a hub for manufacturing cars and so much more right mm-hmm. so, uh, so clearly there are there is activity industrial activity transport activity happening in other cities of the country then why mm-hmm. is it that delhi is, has a problem delhi has a problem partly because of its unique geographical and meteorological reasons so in my mm-hmm. book i call it the meteorological misfortune mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. which is something that uh, you know delhiites 
or I mean in general anyone cannot really help. It's just the state of reality. So you cannot move mountains. You cannot make winds uh, blow when you want uh, when you want them to. So what uh, the main issue with Delhi is that. Uh, firstly, just to clarify, it's not only a Delhi problem, right? It's North a India. North Indian problem. So let's let's yeah. Uh, yeah. let's expand this uh, from one city to kind of include uh, the air shed around Delhi, which includes rural areas, which includes neighborhood towns, which includes uh, you know the entire region. In fact, from Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, it actually goes uh, all the way towards Bangladesh also. But you know, in general, this Northern Indian Gangetic Plain region. Hmm. So think of it this way: in the uh, through the year, we we are polluting. We are polluting the same amount. In fact, at least uh, I mean, if you remove the stubble burning part, the rest of hmm. it still hmm. remains. But the winds carry it away. So every day there's a reset button because you pollute, the winds take it away. You pollute, the winds take it away, and, and this keeps going on. So you don't really hmm. feel it, say, in the peak of the summer or or around that time. Then what happens around October? Uh, three or four things change. One is the wind direction changes. So okay. no longer uh, are we able to evacuate all the uh, emissions, all the pollution that have uh, that has come out. Secondly, the wind speeds slow down. So wind speeds become half of what they usually are. So earlier, you know, uh, your pollution would be carried away very quickly. Now it is not being carried away very quickly, and it's being taken to the other direction. This happens in the winter. This happens in the winter. You, it it starts around late, you know, mid to late October when the temperatures start falling. Uh, in addition to this, there is uh, you know something called temperature inversion, atmospheric inversion. These are concepts on of meteorology. Without getting into the depths of it, let's just say that due to the unique pressure conditions and temperature conditions, all this <coughs> particulate matter kind of settles down. Mm. Uh, the, it, there is a there is almost like a lid which is about uh, 50 meters or 100 meters high uh, beyond which this particulate matter is not able to kind of uh, it's not able to uh, basically go through the ceiling mm. and fly away so anything so if you if you were uh, to say light a bonfire you can actually visibly see that the smoke from the bonfire is going a little up and then it's kind of dissipating it's not really rising beyond the point sort of like under a dome of sorts yeah it's all exactly so it is like a dome hmm. and then all of this is further complicated because there's a the himalayas to the north in fact it uh, not just like to the north but it's like almost an entire uh, you know say two or three sides of this hmm. entire gangetic plain region is covered uh, by mountains and hmm. uh, and the winds are not able to carry anything you know to that height beyond that, yeah. so therefore this entire region anything that gets emitted just gets stuck and it gets stuck and it remains stuck for a long time which is why for the whole winter period from uh, late october so november december jan feb this problem remains due to uh, these unique conditions which actually is a lesson for us it's a lesson that this reality will remain you cannot do anything about this reality what you can change is the way you behave the way that you are able uh, to you know kind of uh govern your polluting industries your transport your agriculture you yeah. will have to work doubly hard than a city like chennai would have to if chennai wanted to clean its air chennai wanted to clean its air it could do a few retrofits on its industries and maybe have electric vehicles and bam you're done hmm. in a city or even like a delhi, city like mumbai also considering exactly. we are on the coast yeah absolutely but a city like delhi will have to go beyond just that because hmm. of these unique uh, atmospheric and geographical conditions Okay, so let's let's now get into like brass tacks. Okay, if you're, uh, I guess even though we said just now that uh, this pollution affects most of North India, we I guess we focus on Delhi because that's where um, I guess most of the research and most of the attention is coming from. And uh, when was it? I think in 2016, the government at the time were uh, like you know enemy number one became vehicular traffic. Okay. and uh, if you remember there was a odd even system then they banned older diesel vehicles etc and has that made i mean we are now 4 years later right we are in 2020 now has that made a difference actually just one small addition to that uh-huh. also with with the same question uh, in addition to that i just want to ask first of all how are these sort of proportions measured 
like all you know because we see a lot of reports that because one will say oh construction industry is the biggest polluter someone mm. will say uh, petrochemicals is the biggest polluter someone will be like it's cars and stuff like that. so is do we have set systems in place that are doing it properly and do we have some sort of a consensus on what is polluting more or what is polluting less okay so i think uh, you know bo- both are very relevant questions let's start with how it's measured and then we can get to transport so yeah. uh, you know there are different uh, methodologies and different scientific uh, instruments that help us do this w- what is generally the accepted manner of learning about the world these days is one to have some ground based sensors and secondly to have some satellite imagery and you kind of juxtapose both and you try to figure out you know how things are like we can study and study wind directions you can therefore study where if pollution is coming from outside delhi which direction it's coming from so those are the kind of that's the kind of help that satellite imagery does but because uh, unfortunately different institutions in the country do these source apportionment studies so these studies are called source apportionment basically they're trying to apportion the sources of the pollution like as in put it into categories to see kahan se aa raha hai so the the idea here is that you know you put these sensors uh, in some pre decided uh, locations around the city and uh, once you have these predecided locations you measure it over time you do hmm. uh, you do a survey of where the local pollutants are so you know that industries are here you know that there's some transport activity here there's some you know maybe some uh, biomass burning fires over there so you put all that information together you study the chemical composition of the air and you're able to then make estimates as to what the you know where the pollution is coming from the issue is uh, as tushar as you were uh, trying to point out that there is no u- uniform methodology mm-hmm. so one institution may use a certain set of locations and they may do it in the month of jan and then they may do it again in the month of july uh, another institution may pick up a completely different uh, you know sets of uh, locations and they may do it at a different time of the year they may mm-hmm. uh, instead of doing it uh, for maybe you know they, they may do it for a longer time frame but only at one time of the year so there are different methodologies being used by different institutions which creates a problem because often uh, these studies become uncomparable over time so you cannot say just because today you know tra- this one study showed transport at 25% the other one showed at 17% it doesn't mean that's actually reduced that's not what's happened it's just that mm. both had different methodologies so obviously the d- measurements were different mm. which is why i say that we should not worry too much about the specific number of each mm. sector so uh, uh, how does it matter to you so if you were uh, if you were the environment minister mm. how would it matter to you if it was 19% instead of 23% mm. it won't you still mm. have to deal with the problem regardless okay. of what percentage it is right mm. so i think that is that is the key uh, you know uh, that that fact should drive our understanding even for the transport sector mm. so again the question that you asked is if uh, you know uh, is is transport one of the key causes and has this focus by the government on odd even and so on really made a difference okay mm. again there are two ways to kind of uh, estimate this now take something like odd and even how do you know that odd and even either succeeded or failed like how would you test its veracity yeah you would test it by uh, uh, there are several ways so for example you could say that okay uh, today the pollution level is uh, as an hypothetical number say is 100 tomorrow we did the uh, odd and even so half the cars were not half all, of all cars half of the private vehicles which are petrol and diesel only them okay mm. which is a small fraction of the overall number of cars so they are the ones who are going to be off off road right uh, so let's assume therefore that uh, of the, all the road vehicles i mean so uh, buses are still running trucks are still there Uh, you know three wheelers cab are still there, two wheelers are, cabs are there only private vehicles have been reduced so let's say hmm. that 10% of the cars are fewer on the road now on this hmm. on the second day and then you notice that the air pollution levels was 100 yesterday it's still 100 today you hmm. conclude ki it did not work right uh, but there could be other thing that have changed in these two days maybe it was windier maybe it was less windy on the day that uh, odd and even was done so therefore the pollution remained, levels remained higher even though there were fewer cars on the road mm-hmm. or maybe the uh, manufacturing unit maybe brickens were running on over overdrive uh, you know on that day and therefore there was more pollution measured so that's mm-hmm. not the way you do it you you cannot really you know measure uh, 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 pollutants across time because variables change on different days so the other way you do it is that you can 
uh, measure it in two different locations. But again, that creates a problem because different locations have different characteristics. You know, some mm. if we measure Chandigarh and Delhi, now Chandigarh has bigger, broader roads and fewer cars and maybe not industries, maybe something else. Delhi has mm. some other issues. So you cannot really compare across locations. Therefore, it becomes a little bit uh, difficult to to kind of uh, verify scientifically whether odd and even has succeeded or not. There was one study though, what they did is because they knew that Delhi has uh, uh, odd and even, but not Noida, not Gurgaon, not these other cities around around Delhi. And mm. these cities are similar to each other in many ways, you know, in the sense that they uh, they have the same kind of profile of cars and so on. Not entirely right. similar, but less dissimilar than say Mumbai and Delhi. Okay. Mm. So, so they did this and uh, th- that study again found that, you know, there was some difference of eight or 10%, uh, you know, lesser pollution compared to, uh, compared to the place that did not have odd and even. Uh, but I think the better way to understand this issue is that, look, in general, when there are going to be fewer cars on the road, there will be mm. less pollution. Okay. Mm. It's an intuitive thing. Doesn't matter if the numbers show that or not. Okay. But the question really is, does that solve the problem? Like, does that address air pollution from the roads? The answer to that question is unfortunately no, because mm. your air pollution is not just coming from private cars. In fact, uh, uh, petrol cars don't pollute as much because of the yeah. nature of petrol itself. Yeah. You know, petrol does not lead to a lot of PM 2.5. Diesel you know, I was, uh, yeah. I was, uh, I think 2014 or 2016 mm. auto expo. I was uh, in Delhi at that time at Pragati Medan, right, for the auto expo. And uh, I remember there was one of those situations where I think the Delhi government, I think this was 2016. And uh, what they had done was they had banned the sale of diesel cars with engines larger than two liters. Mm. Okay. Uh, Even new cars, engines larger than two liter banned. And uh, Auto Expo was happening at that time. So the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover was there. Okay. And all obviously like Jaguar Land Land Rover cars are diesel, have diesel engines than the SUVs. And they're all obviously larger than two liters. And this guy was really upset. Okay, obviously now because his <laughs> half of his range was banned, but also because he was like, "Look, if you, the fact is that with our technology, the technology, the clean air technology that we are using, and the emission controls that we are using, the air coming, going, getting sucked into this car's air filter is cleaner, that is dirtier than the air that's coming out of the exhaust." <laughs> Okay. And at that time, we were like, uh, you know, this sounds very bizarre. But then apparently someone later on went and, you know, only with numbers identified the quality of air that was going into an exhaust in Delhi and the quality of air that is coming out of the Jag- out of the Land Rover. And they found a damn, there's actually, it's actually cleaner. The, the, the Land Rover is actually serving as this giant ass filter for, <laughs> for Delhi air. No, but uh, uh, I just like to no, mention another, that uh, we have not been sponsored by Jaguar. Sadly, <laughs> I wish we were. I wish we were. Uh, I wish welcome. we were. I'd like a, so if you're listening, I'd like a Jaguar. Should, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know another another weird anecdote that I heard. Okay, now mm-hmm. maybe you could uh, tell me if this is factual or not. Because see, you have to understand that when I was an auto journalist, a lot of the stuff that I was hearing was very pro auto propaganda. Okay, so you have to correct me if I'm wrong over here. But one other thing that I heard, like in Delhi, especially one of the reasons why particulate matter is so bad, okay, in Delhi, is because it's related to cars, but not directly, right? In the sense that because Delhi has so much of an auto, uh, so much of vehicular traffic, right? Trash, mm-hmm. trucks, buses, etc. on the road. And also Delhi in the winter, the humidity drops to like very low levels. Right. So there's a lot of dust that's flying around. And apparently, if Delhi's municipality washed the streets of Delhi, like any other large city in the world where, you know, they wash the streets like once a day or sorry, once a week or once every three days or whatever, the situation of Delhi, Delhi's particular matter would be much less. Is this does this have any factual bearing or not? Uh, it does. It absolutely does. Oh, uh, does it? But not okay. the whole thing. Not the whole. Okay. So let, let's break it down again. So basically, uh, also it's, sorry, it's, one more thing. So yeah. in addition to that, also, do you think like covering curbs 
instead mm-hmm. of leaving land there covering them yeah. with pavements or road or something would that also help in fact that is the key that is the key to key, key to uh, solving that aspect of the problem see firstly uh, joel you know uh, uh, with air pollution this is a very common narrative you talk to somebody in one particular industry or one particular profession they will always hmm. be like are but usko dekho na that is the one that is the hmm. real cause we are hmm. just such a small pro- part of the problem so if you talk to farmers they'll be like why are you looking at us you know it's your industries and vehicular traffic is like total i mean it's more than half the pollutants you talk hmm. to the auto industry like oh but we are just like you know whatever you can break it down into further parts hmm. four wheelers like personal cars are like Five, not even five percent of the problem. So similarly, mm. industries will be like, "Arey, but you know, don't look at industry as a whole. We are just a power plant. Power plants are only five percent of the problem. Everyone mm. is a five percent of the problem. Mm. Then who whose fault is it? Then how do we kind of address that? Yeah, issue? yeah. So I think the answer here is that firstly, uh, the vehicular industry will also have to play be a part of the solution as they now are. for different mm. reasons like you know electric vehicles are finally becoming a thing there's there's been pressure on say you know the volkswagens of the world in uh, in germany uh, and in the us where they you know installed those cheat devices after which you know there was a there was a big fine on them and now there have been some regulation that they have to clean up and it's a mm. part of that image rebuilding exercise where you know for example volkswagen has that id3 id4 then these new electric mass electric vehicles that are coming out so they are yeah. doing this because the technologies are better and so on right but uh, and this is a part and this is how they can be a part of the solution and they should definitely strive to be a part of the solution but mm. yes it is absolutely true that uh, dust as such is a major part of the problem uh, but the dust would be less of a problem if the cars were not kicking it up as they drove on it right mm. so uh, what what tushar mentioned about uh, you know uh, about the curbs is see this is a generally i think it's a, a fault of our contracts in many ways we give contracts to make roads we don't mm. specify how the road should be made you know it should like if the contracts were clear that it has to be paved from end to end there should be no part that has loose soil on it in fact delhi also has another issue where there are a lot of parking lots that are just Uh, you know, just Feels, open plots right? of land. Yeah. 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 Kachar, yeah. Kachar, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So again, cars are going and coming, and you know, of course, there's one other aspect to it which nobody can help, which is Rajasthan is on one side, so mm-hmm. you know, uh, it will not automatically bring some dust in, and that's mm-hmm. just a de- thing that you have to deal with. In mm-hmm. fact, there's another uh, angle to. Uh, in fact, there are two more angles to this dust problem. One is that construction activity is happening. So mm-hmm. you know, in India, we don't really you know have those. Um, Uh, those uh, exactly those covers which uh, like in other countries you really have to put them i saw a lot in chennai huh? they are very strict about this from whatever i've heard even in delhi has become strict now okay so uh, you know somebody was doing some construction activity in their home and uh, they got a fine the next day 10000 rupees that uh, you know you do not cover it but maybe mm. that's also a way to i mean i'm sure if if you bribe them you probably not yeah. get this but i think they have now started taking this seriously in delhi because they know that if they don't do it then construction activity Beautiful. gets halted for like 2 months because of a court order or something and then yeah. that you know has its own costs so uh, so yeah that's one aspect of the second aspect is that because of air, because of climate change a lot of uh, land around delhi and in fact just normally like north india has become drier and over which we did you know if we do some if we clear out the field and we do some you know agriculture and then the agriculture like we do it for a year or two and then they stop uh, you know using that uh, as agricultural land then that land basically has no roots and because of climate change and, and so on it generally has become drier so that there's just more dust going around now than there probably was you know several decades ago so there there is more dust to to arrive into a city like delhi and therefore i definitely do think delhi needs a dust management plan you know this is something i've been saying for a long time nobody takes me seriously Uh, uh except in the in the research committee i'm talking about like politicians and so on uh, a dust management plan would basically focus only on dust and nothing else it would uh, you know uh, on a map identify all the open fields in delhi and have it either paved or you know put some trees or you know uh, grass or do something to kind of cover it up and find all the roads that are unpaved from curb to curb and and pave that if you do mm. these two things you could definitely reduce pollutant levels by a good 4 to 5% for from this these two things alone 
Dust, you know, you uh, were... dust falls into PM10 or 2.5 or both. lower? Both. both. Okay. Yeah, it depends on the size, but both. Okay. You know, another, uh, like uh, we were talking earlier, right? There's two main villains. There's, there's vehicular traffic, of course, and then there's this stubble burning. Okay. But uh, stubble burning must have been happening for centuries now, no? They have not uh, changed uh, the process. So how does, uh, so was it not a problem in the past or why is it, or are they trying to identify new villains? So when I started uh, doing research, to, you know, on this problem, I myself didn't know because I'm, I'm a researcher of, you know, energy and, and climate change as uh, from the policy perspective. I did not really have an idea about Indian agriculture. This is one of my leading questions too, as I approach this subject. That mm. why on earth is it a problem in 2020 or back then, say 2016 and 15 when I was doing the research? Mm. Why, you know, obviously this must be ha- must have been happening for centuries, if not millennia, ever since humans got together and started living in, in villages and having agriculture, right? Mm. Turns out that's not the case at all, you know. So, okay. yes, farmers may have been burning their, fee- you know, some leftovers on the field uh, in small patches here and there. But in fact, stubble burning is just a very extremely recent phenomena. Something that oh. only has gath- uh, basically started and gathered momentum in the 70s, 80s and later. Okay. Now you may wonder why that is because agriculture has been there forever. Correct. Yeah. So, so tell me, Joel, like when you imagine Punjab, say if you were going mm. to rural Punjab, can you describe what comes into your mind? You might be, I don't know if you've been to Punjab, but you yeah, know, through have, movies and so on. Oh, you have. So, t- uh, what does rural Punjab look like to you? I guess uh, fields, yeah, green fields. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, exactly. So you you imagine green fields, you know, sarson ke like those uh, those the scenes uh, from Shah Rukh Khan. Basically, Ashraj. So basically, Ashraj movie. Yeah. Even exactly. though apparently it was filmed in Switzerland, in Switzerland right? those scenes. <laughs> Parts <laughs> of it were Delhi. I think sarson ke fields were probably around uh, Punjab, Punjab and, and so on. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, but the, my, the reason I asked you this question is because that's not how Punjab was. Hmm. That's not how this entire region was. Uh, it looks green now, but it, this is a result of the uh, green revolution hmm. that India had uh, oh, okay. starting the 1970s. Hmm. What basically changed? So this is basically a dry region. It, it, hmm. It's not meant to look like this. Uh, hmm. It's a region where, of course, you would. I mean, it's it's not as dry as Rajasthan or something, but it's still. Hmm. Uh, it would have like you know shrubs, and it 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 would not really be able to contain the kind of agriculture that you associate Punjab with. Hmm. Right now, it's a hmm. rice bowl of the country. So back in the day, when the agri- when agriculture used to happen, it used to be small scale, hmm. and they used to have one crop a year. When you okay. have one crop a year, and you have you know traditional varieties of seeds. You basically grow your uh, crop in the year and Mm. then you have several months before you use the uh, field again, before you use the the land again, which means that over time, your cows will eat the remaining shrubs or the remaining parts of your, you know, harvest. Uh, And in general, it gets kind of, uh, it'll be eaten by the the soil and it will will refurbish and make the ground rich with nutrients again. Mm. What happened since the green revolution? So green revolution is actually one of the causes of the of the problem that we are seeing now. So mm. after the green revolution, we now have the rice wheat cropping system in in mm. uh, the agriculture community. They call it RWCS, you know, because okay. we all love acronyms. So uh, so the RWCS basically uh, now has a rice followed by the wheat crop in, mm. in every agriculture cycle, and they uh, they are uh, the timing of this is such that you don't have enough gaps between the two crops and we don't have gaps between the two, two crops because uh, one of the other things that uh, the green revolution did is that it mm. made tube wells very very uh, popular Ooh, so okay. uh, in fact a lot of people in punjab and haryana call the green revolution as the tube well revolution so it was partly a tube well revolution because everyone mm. got it. So suddenly a dry region was able to suck out all the water from, from the land and you know, there was water everywhere and you could grow whatever, the, whatever you wanted twice a year. You didn't have to wait mm. for the monsoons and all of that. Mm. So now that led to another problem. What problem? Keeps everyone is using t- so much tube well that the groundwater levels basically depleted. 
So mm. now we, uh, you know, the, the ground just doesn't have enough water to make it a sustainable practice. Then the government comes in and says, Ki, oh, this is a problem. And this is, again, recent, okay, in the last uh, 10, 10, 15 years. Government comes in and says, oh, this is a problem. We cannot have, you know, uh, you people kind of just uh, draw all the water, uh, you know, uh, through the year and, and uh, make the whole land dry. And this is not sustainable. And our children will not be able to, uh, you know, grow on this, on this very land if you finish the water. So what do you hey. do about it? You wait for the monsoons to come in to align with the crop cycle. So that okay. at least some of the irrigation gets dis, uh, displaced. At least some of okay. the tube well, uh, you know, mm. instead of drawing 100 liters of water, you're drawing only 60 because a bit of it, the monsoon has taken care of. So okay. because of that law, the time between the, so the, that law basically means that the government decides when you can do the harvest and when you can do the, when you can uh, put the seeds in. So now the gap between the two crops, uh, two cycles is as low as three weeks, two weeks four weeks which means how do you do it now like yeah. you you basically have no time on your hands and you have to prepare your land for the next crop and you can either employ people to take it out but that's too expensive right or you can get machines that's also too expensive the cheapest mm. thing is a bit of kerosene 10 rupees worth of kerosene in a bottle and one mm. two rupee matchstick in your hand mm. that's all you need and you can clear it out in a few hours and that's what happens now Oh shucks! This is one of those TIL things. <laughs> yeah, no, it's one of those, yeah. So I think uh, just the fact that they moved the sowing season by two week, two months has yeah. done this pretty much. Like at least uh, in in this case. Yeah. Which is but, why these uh, solutions don't work. You know, when they say, "Okay, let's let's give machinery and let's yeah. do this," uh, hey. the, the problem is in the design of the process itself. Until you change the design of the process, uh, you know, giving just one solution for stubble itself will not do it. Or maybe just stop but growing rice in Punjab. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, uh, I think one of the big uh, solutions to this, I mean, this is a long-term solution. We have short-term and long-term solution. The long-term okay. solution is definitely to diversify the crops. So you need to kind of go away from rice and wheat. I mean, have rice okay. and wheat to the extent that we need it. We have so much rice and wheat that, I mean, our, our entire uh, exactly is rotting because we just keep uh, you know, accumulating it. We don't even need that much rice and wheat in this country. Hmm. That much yeah. rice and wheat is instead they should make they should have different types of cash crops, vegetables. This that, there are different things you can do. Yeah, so, yeah. But you know, um, this uh, the when every there's all there's a lot of politics involved over here as well, right? Because this is um, you know on the one hand I see this as something where there is pressure for governments to respond. Because it's such an immediate thing, like you said, you know, you look at your air filter that's clogged with so much crap every day, or you wash your face and there's black stuff coming off it. And at the same time, there doesn't seem to be enough pressure, right? Like because I, the, like sorry. I feel that uh, we've, we've gotten to that point where there was a lot of outrage five years ago, but now it's it feels like we've learned to live with it. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I think this outrage cycle is again a once in a year kind of thing. It it mm, comes yeah. and goes with the season, uh, and it it may also be restricted uh, to certain classes of the society mm. uh, in urban areas. I think uh, uh, it's heartening to know that 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 is slightly changing in mm. the sense that uh, for the first time ever, uh, the last Delhi elections had air and quality of air on the political agenda. Not mm. just on the policy. Policy agenda, pe toh, they put, you can put anything. You can put cryptocurrency. And, mm. But when it's a political agenda, when you're putting money for advertisements, <clears throat> it means that uh, your constituents care for it. And that's why mm. you're caring to communicate the issue to, to the public. Okay. So what that basically means is that finally, air pollution may have arrived in a city like uh, Delhi mm. on the political agenda, the electorate as well as politicians. Mm. But having said that, it is still not the top issues. The moment uh, some other greater issue comes, it like the concentration just shifts. As in, uh, the simplest example is what we experienced this year with the lockdown, okay. and the air quality basically just improved significantly. Like we could, uh, our uh, it was absurd. On one of the days, the AQI was two, just wow. the number two. <clears throat> A level that has never been seen, uh, you know, on, on a normal year. 
so it was absurd uh, uh, that we could actually see clearly we could breathe clearly the windows were open you know even the air purifiers were like you know we can just rest now there is nothing to do <laughs> it was it was it was uh, 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 it was truly amazing to see that you know that that if humans could correct our ways of doing things we can see the results very quickly it's not mm-hmm. something that you have to wait for tens of years mm-hmm. but this came at a cost it came at the cost of people not having jobs it came at the cost of everyone having to stay indoors and not earning um, uh, not earning money it came at the cost of people losing their livelihoods so th- therefore at a time like this obviously air pollution will not be the biggest concern the biggest concern mm. then was get people back to work or give them mm. a salary or give them some you know ways to uh, to access food and shelter and so on so that is basically the problem with air pollution in a developing country like india that mm. it is only a problem until there are no bigger problems the moment your livelihood is at stake that becomes mm. the biggest problem and rightly so mm-hmm. but isn't that something that we always that is the biggest like the uh, issue rather with uh, with not just in india but the environmental movement everywhere that is what is said ki like okay now so what do you want us to do either we we you can sit everyone can sit at home and we can have clean beautiful air or we work and we have industry and we have factories and whatever and we deal with some pollution does does it have to exist in this kind of binary absolutely not and i think it has changed uh, globally like this conversation is is had a paradigm shift in the last 5 or 10 years mm. it is uh, uh, the the conversation has been led by the climate community mm. but uh, but it can be applied to the air pollution context as well mm. so what mm-hmm. this basically means is that uh, all this while the climate community has uh, demonstrated how acting on climate change acting on emissions acting on any other form of pollutants mm. has actually been good for the economy okay it has been good 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 for gdp growth it's been good for uh, public administration and we have uh, and the proof is uh, overwhelming mm. and we have already seen it in a country like india also and i think okay. therefore uh the conversation has now moved away from that oh we need to tax carbon or mm. we need to you know uh, penalize someone for things to improve of course we still need to penalize if someone's really polluting and you know violating all norms and of course there will be a penalty in those cases mm. but the economy at whole will does not need to be punished in mm. fact the economy at whole will benefit therefore your sh- in the short term when the conflict is between say air and jobs obviously jobs are given primacy mm-hmm. but uh, every politician or every government now understands that in the longer run working on these issues is actually better for the economy so in india's case say air pollution itself air pollution costs india billions of us dollars in in gdp every year so we could mm-hmm. actually improve our gdp growth rate also if we were to mm-hmm. you know uh, comprehensively act on it but even on a more short term basis so that's a very long term economic macro economic view right i'm talking about short term now uh, in the short term acting on clean energy uh, investments has led to improving gdp it has led to creation of new jobs uh, it has led to lowering pollution at the same time and all these uh, you know goals are being met as an example our solar uh, power program so we have a target of 100 gigawatts by 2022 which will probably not be met matlab it may be met on paper but in reality the the you know panels and the uh, uh, the solar fields may not be in place uh, by that year mm-hmm. but it is still a very aggressive plan to re- transform the power sector in the country that mm-hmm. has led to the creation of tens of thousands of good quality jobs and the target that we have for the year to, to 2030 which is 450 gigawatt of uh, of solar power just uh, of oh, sorry of renewable power just to put this in context today india's entire grid this includes coal gas mm. uh, you know solar wind everything is 300 and something like 320 340 something like that mm. we're saying we're going to by 2030 in just 10 years everything that we have achieved since independence in terms of uh, power capacity growth mm. 
we will double that but only in the renewables uh, side in the next 10 years so what this basically means is that there will be literally lakhs of new good quality jobs which are safer which don't end up killing you and which generate electricity without polluting so this is just one example of how there's no dichotomy between having cleaner environment anymore if you analyze it in the right context if you're able to provide solutions rather than just penalize something because as uh, research and innovation has reached this place where you can actually find alternatives that are cleaner mm. better in every every way so right now uh, the problem the issue uh, uh, like you said the technology seems to exist so the problem is just will or the lack of will so will is i think a big uh, determinant in fact there's mm. an anecdote about the will here sometimes uh, sometimes will can be a little uh, uh, you know too optimistic for our own good mm. so india mm. used to have uh, in the year 2014 used to have a target of 20 gigawatt of solar power by the year 2022 okay okay uh, 20 gigawatt itself was a paradigm uh, you know shift from what existed back then because back mm. then it, the actual capacity was just some 2 or 3 gigawatt So you're mm-hmm. saying from two to twenty is almost like a ten x we will rise in only mm-hmm. about six seven years, which is also un uh, uh, you know unthinkable of, and people thought it will not uh, succeed. Mm-hmm. Then uh, uh, you know the government changed, and uh, the current prime minister, who back then was Gujarat CM in Gujarat, they had more solar just because you know there the solar industry was a little more developed. So he thought that no, for India also we should increase the ambition now, and it was mm-hmm. not just a case of will. i think they had also you know uh, probably understood that the winds were in that direction because you know mm-hmm. china and other countries were investing so let's kind of raise the ambition mm-hmm. so th- then there was a new bureaucrat like a new head of department in the ministry of new and renewable energy so okay. because he was new in that position he was not fully aware of the, what the conversation that had already taken place between his ministry and the prime minister's office okay. one day the prime minister called him alone and he went the prime minister said okay we you know this target of uh, and ba- remember this back then it was just 2 2 or 3 gigawatts he said at mm. that time 20 is not enough let's increase it to 100 he's like mm. can this happen so the pm just used a number like 100 is a big enough number it's a round number so you say 100 <laughs> the bureaucrat was like uh, uh, yes it is done obviously you're sitting in front of the pm you will not say no <laughs> right you will just be like yes whatever you ask we will do that mm. then he came back to his office and he called a meeting and uh, he said ki this is what's happened now we have to do 100 gigawatts and everyone's like what the hell have you said mm. like it is just not doable it's it's impossible mm. we don't have the land the money the resources the technology it's too expensive uh, that much in the grid the grid will only collapse like there is no way you can put a 100 gigawatts of solar capacity in just like in a matter of 5 years mm. uh, but uh, so now it came down to this where the bureaucrat had to either go to the pm and apologize and take back his word and that would basically mean that the bureaucrat would get fired mm. uh, he had another option which he discussed with his minister and he said ki okay let's just try to do this it's absurd but let's try to do this okay anyway they they tried they they you know kind of uh, uh, they they because of the lack of options they reformed the entire sector in the sense that they got a new lot of new instruments and new ways to acquire land and this and that and now we have already crossed the 20 gigawatt number we, mm. you know, a, a year or two years ago and we are quickly heading towards 100 we won't reach 100 100 is still mm. over ambitious but we are well well beyond the 20 gigawatt target that was initially set so this is basically an illustration of how uh sometimes just the will power to do something can have a very big difference on outcomes mm. uh, but this also has another lesson which is that please listen to your scientists if they're saying 100 is not possible then let's find a number that is actually possible which maybe they would have said 60 which is more reasonable and 60 mm. is actually doable so mm. it's just one of those things but how sorry, long does it t- uh, sorry to share go ahead uh, so now that you have mentioned the, the how much of this energy mix is also something that affects the way pollution works in general in the country and sort of in the north uh like you mentioned renewable so how are we approaching this and how much of a cause of pollution are coal fired plants and also 
are we missing out on a trick by avoiding nuclear um okay so india's energy mix is currently dominated by the use of coal mm. okay, coal mm. because of historical reasons like if you look at sri lanka's energy mix you will see that or rather their electricity generation mix you will see that hydro power is the biggest mm. in some other country you will see gas is the biggest mm. why is coal the biggest in has a biggest share in india simply because we just have a lot of cheap coal it's mm. not even good quality coal indian coal, yeah. coal quality is terrible yeah. it's terrible it's very, apparently yeah, it's very it polluting ash, right very polluting ash content very low energy mm. uh, content so you have to burn more coal for the same amount of you know uh, electricity generated there's a lot of issues with indian coal mm. but it's just so, so cheap and it's just around so you therefore want to use you know more of it and which is why coal became dominant in india's energy mix mm. uh this the so called modern renewables which is solar and wind are new in the sense that we could not have had that 40 years ago or 50 years ago because the technology yeah. was either non existent or too expensive like you yeah. know it was almost 100x of what coal costed mm. correct today in 2020 solar is cheaper than coal mm. nobody even even 10 year 5 years ago if if you had said that you know we'd been in a situation already where uh, solar is just like way cheaper than coal people wouldn't have believed it mm. like it was just something that was not in sight this quickly mm. this has happened not just because you know uh, of some will power or something this happened because uh, you know china had started investing in a crazy manner mm. germany had been uh, doing r&d so uh, germany us europe so they have basically bought the cost down and india has benefited from their investments and their r&d so in a way we should be uh, you know working with this global community and and helping you know kind of push the uh, envelope even further so anyway mm. solar and wind has is recently come into the picture hydro uh, has the second largest share after coal okay so mm. uh, and uh, obviously oil is very uh, important to the energy mix but in the electricity mix it has a very small uh, almost ignorable share because mm. uh, you know pe- petroleum is mostly used in either industry or mostly for transport right so uh, so this is what india's energy mix looks like nuclear has a very small share mm. like a very minuscule share right now nuclear is actually the uh, uh, the cleanest form of of electricity mm. generation because even solar and wind and so on require a lot of manufacturing like manufacturing of the mm. actual panels actual you know uh, the the wind turbines and so on mm. and that is a polluting process in itself mm. whereas the uh, nuclear yes it, it's a little bit of pollution when you actually make it but once it's made then there is there's none after that of course there are public concerns over safety mm. public concerns over you know uh, where will the waste go and so on i think these are the two questions that that the public is concerned with but the reason why it is not popular is no, mm. uh, is not just because of the public concerns it is also because it just costs a lot more Mm. and uh, currently it is like significantly more expensive than than solar and uh, and the mix of this public concern plus cost concerns is the reason why it does not have a bigger share in the electricity mix i would personally mm. prefer that that it did uh, because um, the safety question in particular has i think uh, you know despite all the fear that people have it has been uh, answered in the sense that eventually energy is a choice between various options and uh, uh, coal is literally killing uh, 80000 to 1 lakh people in india every single year mm. you know, year yeah. after year whereas nuclear kills <clears throat> zero year after year and yet when you think of safety and energy you think of nuclear you no, never yeah. will think about coal, coal yeah. even though coal is literally killing you know so it's lost like the perception lakh, battle a great deal absolutely and it's not just coal i mean it's not that i want to single out even hydro power i in yeah. india's biggest energy accident was in the hydro sector like one dam hydro power dam burst people died uh, people died in the thousands there's never been an accident in in india on the nuclear side where thousands of people died mm. i'm sure if even if 100 people died they would shut down all nuclear power plants mm. whereas yeah uh, like it's not very uh, I think this uh, hydro and coal and all are not very sexy, right? Nuclear is more 
it's like everyone has seen chernobyl and everyone has like absolutely uh, watched as, like, as i have found out was had a lot of really fact, big factual errors apparently <laughs> it, they played with our emotions yeah <laughs> it was, but it, it was, was really work of fiction <laughs> yeah. yeah i was really sad because i was watching it was like damn look at all these people did and thousands and you know especially at the end where they say 80000 people got cancer and this and that and then i remember reading one of these yeah, a very we, reputed yeah. source they like 80000 people did get cancer but they were all like some sort of i think thyroid cancer which was curable with iodine and the number of casualties from those 80000 was like 1 at 1.6% or something like that and i was like damn they lied to us again they lied to us well while in making India, statements yeah. about lying <laughs> india has a chernobyl every year in the form of coal coal Yeah. and actually it's much worse than chernobyl because chernobyl's entire cancer cases equal to the actual deaths in india due to coal hmm. and yeah. so i mean it's also just, i wanted to ask you so so like when you say coal causes x amount of deaths how are these things measured in the sense like because obviously there is you can't figure out directly right because yeah, you can't yeah. see kahan se hawa gayi so the most ideal way of finding out hmm. how a person died is to have a small sensor attached to them for their entire lives calculating hmm. how much they observe <laughs> this is obviously impossible to do right? Listen, so since you can't the do government that, of india yeah. the government of india wants us wants this <laughs> as we all found out with arogya setu and all that nonsense yeah. this is the eventual dream to have one sensor but like arogya setu it will probably not work Our, uh, people yeah. who are carrying the screenshots of Ar- arogya setu and showing it to you know when ever they need it i mean it just it uh, cannot work in a country like india i think we should be cognizant of the realities of, yeah. uh, of millions of people um ah sorry you were saying basically how are deaths measured with ah, regards yeah. to pollution how do they measure them so since we cannot measure the exposure of individuals oh. you do the next best thing you uh, you try to understand what the impact of air pollution is on the mortality of a population as a whole hmm. so uh-huh. you do studies you take two groups of people mm. uh, you know uh, say 1000 people each where each of these uh, both the groups have the exact same composition mm. same number of men women older younger uh, you know economic uh, situation the same same number of smokers same number of non smokers so basic composition of these two groups are the same mm. then you uh, then you measure the air pollution levels in the places that they reside so in say one resides in delhi one resides in switzerland hmm. and then you over time over 20 years 30 years see how many people are popping dead in among both these groups hmm. and then you also control for things like their diet hmm. their whether they are exercising or not you control for all these other variables to make sure that all else is equal the only difference hmm. between the two groups is is the air that they breathe everything else should be averaged out and and kind of hmm. uh, uh, you know controlled for Mm. such studies have not been done once or twice they have been done through uh, the scientific uh, history in, in modern mm. times and they have done it in uk us so many other co- india has also so we have had a lot of these studies and this study comes out with a a percentage like a a factor which mm. explains that if you increase air pollution level by x percent mm. what will be the impact on the deaths in in that population so mm. the number is about 6% Mm-hmm. and this is a number that has been seen across the board so it's not like it's a different in different studies you know it 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 may vary a little bit but it's more or less kind of standard so basically means that every single time air pollutant levels increase by say 10 units or there's a certain amount like a certain amount of units so many extra people will die in a population of say 100 say if in a in a population of 100 so many more percent people will die prematurely mm-hmm. okay then you use basically then you understand where the air pollution is coming from and and create that factor so we know that uh, coal fired power plants cause this much pollution in the country because it's measurable and then you know what the population of the country is and you know how many people live in the districts where mm. those plants are and you do a simple you know mathematical kind of calculation mm. and this checks out with reality also by the way mm. checks out with reality in the sense that countries and regions with higher uh, you know uh, air pollution do have lower uh, life expectancy hmm. that is easily be easily measurable so it's hmm. uh, you know even within india there are certain places where people are dying earlier certain places where people live longer of course hmm. you control for other things like diet and all but in general 
it checks out it is and, a major factor yeah and and therefore air pollution in india kills uh, 1.6 million people every single year which is staggering it makes it um, it makes air pollution one of the biggest killers in the country and you will never have air pollution as a cause of death on your certificate hmm. because you would have died from other things and you never realize that air pollution either caused it or uh, it made it worse so you know so, so india is also the diabetes capital of the world and diabetes is also caused by air pollution people did not know that until recently because the studies were just coming out so these are the kind of things that we are learning about the problem now that's the thing right because like for example when you say 1.6 million people in india die because of air pollution do you think that is also the reason that we don't sort of notice because like a heart attack you see uh, a diabetic dying whatever going to an icu and dying you see but like air pollution in a way is an abstract concept is that why also we sometimes don't absolutely don't it's, it's it not up. spectacular enough no yeah if people were dying like just popping up popping dead on the streets yeah you would start taking notice all these deaths are so de- fragmented they're happening in you know beds and hospital beds in in the uh, old age homes in mm. crèches it's not like old people are dying ah huh? so we i'm not talking about when we say 1.6 million people die every year it doesn't mean like a person who would have lived to be 75 is dying at the age of 70 because mm. that those kind of deaths you will probably not even notice cuz yeah. you will think that oh the person's old and there are other complications heart mm. issues here i'm talking about people in their 50s and 60s and 20s and 30s also dying in fact uh, sir if i'm not mistaken 30% but uh, this number could be a little high but a certain percentage of infants dying so the people uh, kids who die before the age of 3 mm. are dying because of air pollution yeah. so we are literally talking about deaths happening across all age groups and it's not something that is restricted to old people i'm told again one more episode where we were approaching the end and we are damn depressed <laughs> <laughs> but so so what are the approaches that governments and individuals and sort of ngos and everyone else is taking towards controlling uh this issue so uh, everyone's trying to do different things government has like a national clean air program then you have you know the solar uh, pla- plans you have uh, a plan of having 30% of all vehicles sales being electric by the year 2030 hmm. you have all these grand plans across the problem is that India does not have a unified plan across sectors. You know, you would just do piecemeal something for this, something for that. Uh, here, actually, I'd like to highlight something that uh, uh, Arunabha Ghosh, who is the CEO of uh, the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water (CEW) based in Delhi, he said in his TED talk that uh, you know India needs a 80-80-80 plan, which basically means that uh, you you need uh, to you need to pick india's 80 biggest cities and reduce air pollution by 80% uh you know in the coming years which uh, which is significantly more than any other plan that is that is around uh, the corner right now the idea there is to have an overarching ambition that uh goes well beyond just you know looking at it in a piecemeal manner and look at Uh, this this air shed approach so it's not an urban issue it's it's mm. it's an urban rural plus surrounding areas kind of mm. issue you pick regions which have a similar air shed and you approach that air shed together there you work with industry sorry uh, what, sure. what is what is an air shed so an air shed is basically uh, you know a, a region where uh, because of the atmospheric conditions because of you know various other physical factors uh, and geographical factors the air quality remains similar okay you know because it could yeah, so it could be uh, in the form of for example an entire region where winds blow a certain uh, in a certain direction that you know temperature changes in the same way and it has a similar composition of say vehicles and you know uh, factories and so on so my point is if you are able to act on the polluting sources in that air shed then mm-hmm. that entire air shed will improve not mm-hmm. just that city you know so delhi is a part of a larger air shed So, if you the way to improve Delhi's air quality is by improving the air shed around it, mm. whereas improving Delhi's air quality will not improve Mumbai's air quality. Mumbai is so a regional focus as such. Yeah, yeah, but that region is not state wise. It's not Haryana. It's separate. more the air it's shed. Air wise. shed, yeah. exactly. So you you pick that jog atmospheric uh, and meteorological kind of uh, mm. uh, boundary mm. rather than uh, state boundary, which is artificially mm. drawn. 
Okay. So, so you pick airsheds and you, uh, you know, work on airsheds. You try to have extremely ambitious plans. You try to transform the economy because you're transforming, uh, you know, your society as a whole. You are able to generate new jobs. You're able to give people a better quality of life. So these are all the things that go along with it. Recently, you, you know, China, Japan, uh, Korea, and the European Union announced a goal of having zero net zero emissions by the year 2050. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is significant. Like they, yeah. the, collectively, they're uh, almost 50%. The half the world's uh, yeah. pollution comes from, I mean, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from these folks. India may not be able to do that because we are, uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, we are still behind the development curve. There's mm. still a lot more growth to happen before because India's per capita emissions is still a small fraction of, of the world average. Mm. Mm. But we must have a similar approach for air pollution. Right. So our uh, approach to air pollution is that in the next five years, we should be able to reduce air pollution levels by 80 percent. Mm-hmm. This will also have knock off impacts on greenhouse gas and so on. But our focus should be air pollution because that's something that is local. You cannot claim that, you know, uh, India's air polluted because USA was growing in industrial mm-hmm. uh, in the industrialization era. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, one big much, one that everyone talks about. No, that Exactly. But which is which is which is weird because like you said, eighty thousand people a year are dying of air pollution. So, one point six million. Eighty thousand is from coal alone. Coal alone. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> one point six million. Yeah, damn. Wow. We again, we've come to the end of yet another <laughs> episode where we are like, oh. Yeah. No, so no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll leave you yes, with tell a, us something optimistic. I'll leave yeah, you with please. A, because I'll leave you the fact. And okay. that fact is an optimistic fact. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, in other countries, uh, we they have not taken it for granted the way we have because it's become mm. so ubiquitous now. So in a country like Norway, I've lived in Norway for a brief while, uh, mm. lo- uh, LED bulbs are very rare. Most mm. of the bulbs that I use are incandescent, you know, the old style. Uh, yeah, bulbs. the yellow ones. Oh, okay. yeah. In India, LED is everywhere, right? Mm. Like mm. Uh, your homes are probably lit by LEDs. Most homes are lit by LEDs. It's something that just exists everywhere. There are, uh, in the last five, six years, from one government program called Ujala, in that plan alone, 370 million LED bulbs have been sold in the country. Wow. Okay. okay. What this has meant is that uh, only through this bulb transformation in the country, we hmm. have been able to avoid the equivalent of 10 large coal-fired power plants. That is, wow. okay. uh, if we did not have these LED bulbs, if we had mm. the older style bulbs, we would mm. need 10 more polluting, like coal-polluting uh, power plants. So we have avoided that, which is a lesson. It's a lesson that you can grow the economy, you can save energy, you can prevent pollution, and mm. all of this is possible without anyone even noticing. Like it's, you know, you, no one's losing their jobs, no one is... Uh, you know, uh, being uh, penalized with higher taxes. We are doing it. It's silently happening in our background. We, If we use this approach across the economy, across the board, we'd be able to clean out a lot more sectors without people worrying about their jobs and livelihoods. This is uh, this also a good example of how it needs to be institutional. Uh, the solutions have to be institutional because I feel like a lot of the focus sometimes goes on, oh, you should use less this, less that, which is good. Like in your individual life, it's good to make changes, but I think unless changes are institutional, uh, a lot of this stuff will the, not... The change. reason why we all have LEDs is not because we decided, oh, we yeah. are going to change the world. No, because on the marketplace, they are cheap, they last longer, they yeah. provide the same kind of light, and it's and you know it also consumes less electricity. So you're like, chalo, thik, let's, let's spend 50 rupees more, let's get this, but we know mm-hmm. it'll last two, three more years, so mm-hmm. it, like the cost will kind of be... So we need such solutions that people don't have to think about yeah. making sacrifices that you're just yeah. making the right choice because it's such an obvious choice to make. Hmm. Why would hmm. you so make it appealing for people? Yeah. Joel. Cool. No, I guess we are done. Yeah. <laughs> Joel, this was very... <laughs> it was heavy duty. <laughs> <laughs> 
no, no, but you know what? You're right. Uh, I think if there's anything that um, if there's anything that this um, this lockdown has taught us, you know, there were those memes, na, ki like uh, we were the virus, nature is healing itself. <laughs> I think it brought to dramatic focus what can happen if we, if obviously, like you said earlier, you know, the air quality the air quality indicator was two, and because that's what, because that's because no one was driving and people were stuck at home. But there is a compromise value there somewhere that we can have what we want while we also got a glimpse of what the world could be, you know, like there were, I remember in the initial parts of the lockdown, there were all these pictures, some of them were hoaxes, but some of them were true, right? Where you, I remember one from Punjab or Himachal, I think, from Chandigarh, where you could see uh, some range of mountains that has not been visible Which for the last been, 30 uh, years. Which you've never been able to see for like 30 years. But because the smog lifted after a week or 10 days of non of no traffic or whatever, the you the visibility became so much better. I think people have got a, an understanding of what the world can be without uh, without those levels of pollution, you know, mm-hmm. because... Like you, like we were talking earlier, it has become ubiquitous. Every year, Delhi goes through the same shit. But we got a glimpse of what, like you know, it could be uh, what blue skies and clean air could be. I think that has uh, that has played a major role in 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 motivating people, I guess, to push. Yeah. For or more. if you can't do that, uh, just build your city next to the sea. <laughs> and it's yeah. <laughs> Change the geography of the whole country. Change the geography. If yeah. you can't move the pollution, you move basically. But you know, so so I think we we can learn from China here. China has been able to reduce. Uh, you now Beijing used to uh, be known yeah. as the pollution capital. You, know, you may have seen pictures during the Olympics. Of course, yeah. You know, or they reduced their air pollution since then by almost twenty five percent, if not more. So okay. uh, and how did they do it? I mean, of course, let's not get into the specifics of it. Just the big message here. Uh, yeah. They had an overarching policy, the blue skies policy. So they they actually pursued this, but. Yeah. Their prime minister, the, sorry, their uh, the premier made it a political agenda. They went oh. out and basically said that anyone who is not acting on it, and he's talking about his own government, like my officials hey. and so on, I will fire them, or we will hey. ensure that you know people put this on the top. In India, the Indian prime ministers made no statement on a, if you try, go on, just try to Google you know air pollution plus prime minister, you will find zero speeches, zero statements. Nothing has been said. Hmm. His government may be doing a few things here and there, but until you make it a political agenda, it's not going to be addressed. I think, so, like you mentioned in your book, add it to Swachh Bharat. Exactly. So, you know, the, the reason why, so I know Swachh Bharat has also become a little gimmicky in the sense hmm. that people went out with jhadus and, yeah. but in reality, uh, Swachh <laughs> Bharat has had some good, uh, some you know, impact, yeah. uh, component. You and, I, you and I may not notice it because it's not about the leaves on the streets. The, under the Swachh Bharat, uh, you know, uh, Mission, they've had uh, you know sanitation, like they've had uh, hmm. uh, drainages and all that built in rural areas. So some places are seeing benefits of it. You and I may not see it. There's no such thing on air pollution. No, in air pollution, you need that focus. That you know, call it as something, make it a national program, and then let the PM speak about it. Let somebody okay. talk. when there's so many different uh, state chief ministers keep fighting with each other. At least someone from the central government should come and try to bring everyone together. No. Yeah. It cannot, the state of play cannot be you keep fighting with each other all the time. So yeah. That has not happened in India. So that leadership is missing as far as air pollution is concerned. Hmm. Well, hopefully. Well, I guess, yeah. I think, like I said, really we've, we've, seen, <laughs> we've seen what it could be. We've seen what life could be without it. Yeah. And I guess like, you know, I, I hope we start moving towards. Oh, and with the LED, LED example, we've seen that it's possible if you take the initiative as, exactly. as an institution, as a government. Absolutely. So hopefully, that yeah. That is also a government uh, program where, uh, yeah. again, uh, uh, they clearly pursued it and they pursued it uh, and, you they know, uh, in, and they achieved it yeah. and they were able to frame it that way. So again, you'll find a lot of speeches of the Prime Minister talking about the Ujala program and its success. You just need the same approach for air pollution as a whole. Yeah. That's all. Mm. Yeah. That's it. Cool. Right, I think that I uh, guess. Sort of, uh, brings us to slight. We managed to get some optimism out of it towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're like almost forced in that. that. Damn it. Don't make yeah. us, don't depress us again. <laughs> yeah, something, oh, nice. God. something nice. <laughs> Next time we'll talk about uh, floods. Yes, uh, that uh, that is exactly, that's exactly the kind of cheering up that everyone needs. Yeah, at this point, no? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, Siddha, thank you so much for joining us again. And uh, we hope this one is uh, with, is as successful with the audience as the last one was. And 
it's uh, joy would you like to say something no no i'm done i said what <laughs> i needed to say except thank you siddharth thank you siddharth for joining us once again uh, again uh, one of any of those til moments i had like for instance i had no idea that punjab was an arid wasteland till the green revolution <laughs> happened i thought that's how it always was Yeah. But yeah. It's called green revolution for a reason. It, it for a made, reason made it green. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, now obviously now once you've told us, it seems like <laughs> very obvious, right? <laughs> it's all a lie. <laughs> the Bollywood, well, basically, so Bollywood made us believe it. But Bollywood yeah. made us. No, but you know what, Tushar? Now that I think about it, no, if you like earlier on when they wanted to show green fields and all, they went to Kashmir, man. They would never show Punjab like that. No, like, Punjab or, like, was movies in the sixties and all. Yeah, yeah, Punjab was a post NRI phenomenon. You know, once they started targeting ah. the NRIs, and NRIs, yeah. there's a giant Punjabi NRI diaspora. So that's actually Correct, a good yeah. point. Someone should do a research, do some research on that, and see how Punjab was portrayed before the 1970s. That would be an interesting. Yeah, because be just off the top of my head, like when I th- when I think of like uh, Bollywood films and all, where they wanted, like for instance, when they wanted to show organized uh, organized greenery, they would show they would go to Bangalore. Okay, because Bangalore had all those parks and gardens yeah. and all, OT end of these places. And when they show, wanted to show wilderness, they would go to Kashmir, man, or like no, fields and you know. No, wilderness. They also showed like your regular wilderness, which wasn't like crazy green. Huh. Like you know your UP ka like your UP villages or your Bihar huh, villages, huh. which are, which have greenery but like not like not crazy. crazy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that would actually be an interesting topic for someone say PhD. Whoever is listening to us, please do one <laughs> and then come on our show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we go, if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM Network. Uh, you can listen to us on IBM Podcast app or ibmpodcast dot com. You can also follow us on our social media, which is uh, IBM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Siddharth, your uh, social media handles are it's Siddharth three on Twitter, and Twitter is where I'm most available. Okay, Joel, yours. Uh, I'm Pereira Joel. At on Twitter and uh, Joel Pereira dot esq on Instagram. All right, and I'm Yon. Okay, please on Twitter and Tushar underscore Abhi on Instagram. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Tushar. Thanks, Tushar. Bye, bye. Peshe khidmat hai aap ki shan mein hamare anjuman se. Hi, I am Sadaf and I am Arshit. Khane ka itihas. इकोनॉमिक्स पॉलिसी साइकोलॉजी सब है मेन्यू पर ओनली ऑन द नानकारी पॉडकास्ट एवरी वेंसडे सिर्फ आई वी एम पॉडकास्ट ऐप या वेबसाइट पर या फिर जहाँ से भी आप अपने पॉडकास्ट सुनते हो एडवर्टाइजिंग इज डेड यू यू हर्ड मी राइट एडवर्टाइजिंग इज डेड वीर ऑल इन द कॉन्टेंट बिजनेस नाउ Let's not call it news, TV, radio, etc., etc. It's all content, and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet. We're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now, but rather the wider stuff about advertising, media, content, and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it. Tune in every Tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch, and this is my new podcast, Advertising is Dead. <laughs> 